On this episode of Resi Week, we talk Wi-Fi automation at CES, Savant's new 4K tiling, and sleeping on smart lights. All this and more on this episode of Resi Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is Resi Week, episode 155, Vape Pen of Automation. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Peerless AV, driving technology through innovation. Welcome to Resi Week. This is your weekly wrap-up of all the latest news and stories for the residential AV industry. I'm your host, Matt D. Scott for avnation.tv. And today I'm pleased to be joined by the one and only Richard Fergosa. He is the founder and principal of Fergosa Design. How are you doing, sir? Mellow West Coast greetings from an unclosed, uh, uh, an undisclosed embedded location. I'm the embedded correspondent today. So. Embedded today? I yeah. like it. I, I would happily be embedded today because it's stinking <laughs> cold out here. Then we have a, uh, a new timer, so we're going to be incredibly nice to uh, Margie Duffy. She is the Senior Product Manager of Human Interaction at Control4. How are you, ma'am? Good, good. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. And last but not least, we have my partner in crime, Tim Albright. He is the founder of this here, aviation.tv. How are you, sir? I am well. How are you? I'm doing all right. As I mentioned, I'm cold, but it's just- well, I think, I think most know. of the U.S. is cold with the exception of Richie. Yeah. Well, we, we, we got really cold, so we decided we would just share it with everybody else. I've just been stuck with the cold since Thanksgiving. So. Same thing. Same yeah. thing. All right. Let's jump right in. This story <clears throat> comes to us from CE Pro and the one and only Julie Jacobson, CES 2019, Wi-Fi was looking like a home automation standard. If you read through this article, which I suggest you do, she covers really the, the breadth of IoT and, and, and some of the you know, emerging smart home products that were all over the floor at CES and noticed that as a whole, pretty much everything was Wi-Fi. It's not that they were getting rid of all the traditional things like Zigbee and Z-Wave and Bluetooth and, you know, everything else. But predominantly, there was a ton of Wi-Fi. So, Rich, I want to start with you on this. Is this that defining line that separates, you know, DIY products and, and the DIY experience with the HTP experience of, you know, really basing everything on just Wi-Fi? I, I think that's going to be a, a natural demarcation point. I think that with the low, lower powered, uh, lower transmission items like Bluetooth, like Zigbee, um, you have a bit more of an enclosed sandbox to work with. Um, <laughs> there's less trouble you can maybe necessarily get into. As you expand out to Wi-Fi, which you know we've always talked about, it's going to be a wireless world, um, this does require a little bit more technical experience in order to be able to get the units communicating, um, not only on the wireless network, but communicating with one another, that it, it makes sense at that point. It does allow for a demarcation for professionals to be able to come in and say, okay, we're now not only taking care of these items that are connecting, but there are more things to consider maybe than the $39 router that you can get from Target. Um, so yeah, I think that this was definitely a decision at this point from the manufacturers that have said, you know, if we are going to continue this, we need to expand to a much larger standard in order to be able to hit the market share that we're looking for. Very good. Margie, when you, when you look at this, one of the things that Julie said that really caught me was the, the concept of the, the hubless smart home. Is that something that we're really going to continue to see in the future? Or, or again, is that just a DIY realm? I think it's, um, you know, one of the things that I'm noticing is that people in the DIY space, you know, they, they see their Alexa devices controlling everything, right? It can connect to their Nest and their, all their different DIY uh, solutions. And so they start to think that, you know, Alexa is their hub, um, not realizing that, that, um, you don't get the same reliability and, and when you have control inside your home and you don't have to go up to the cloud. Um, so I think the DIY space, we absolutely will see this, this hubless model um, until it breaks. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things that article talked about was you know, we can get up to you know, 30 devices on a, you know, on a, 
on a router and then it, if it drops, uh, then, you know, you start breaking. Um, and I think that's where our industry comes into play of, of I think hubs are, um, people will start realizing that they're really important for us. Very good. Tim, let me, let me pull on that a little bit. Uh, cause it, it's the perfect lead into my question for you is this kind of small scale Wi-Fi automation platform, no hubs, great again for that, that DIY experience. And does it just leave the larger deployments that require, you know, rock solid Wi-Fi and, you know, proper systems, enterprise grade networks? Is that where the HTTP is going to live? I, I think it, it leaves, it leaves the very high end. Right. I mean, really super ultra high end because yeah. all of us, I mean, it, it, I want solid Wi-Fi at my house, right? You want solid Wi-Fi at your house. I, I don't think that just because we don't have two and a half million dollars to, to put down on an AV system doesn't mean we don't, we don't want that. So I think this actually leads in to a, a larger discussion of something that we started having three years ago now. Um, Rich and I were at Cedia and we started having this do it with me uh, type scenario type market mm -hmm. where you know, folks are, are, they might go out and purchase, you know, an Alexa, or they might purchase uh, a, a device that does belong on the network and, and absolutely has to have a solid network. But it also, they need the residential dealers to help them get there. Uh, if they want to put in, say, a control force system to get that the, the next step of the way. All of this, though, has to live and breathe on the bedrock of a really solid network. And I think that is being proved out uh, at every year at CES, every year at Cedia, honestly, every year at ISE. Very good. Let's move on to our next story today. This comes to us from a residential tech today. Savant has added 4K video tiling to their video over IP solutions. If you uh, don't know what video tiling is, it, it's that you know kind of video wall experience where it, you know it allows you to have multiple sources on one screen uh, and move them around and resize and, and do all kinds of really, really cool things with them that typically are the, you know, domain of corporate boardrooms and, and sports bars and things such as that. So, uh, Margie, I want to start with you on this. Sure. Is video tiling, is this really something that the average, and I don't even mean the, the average home technology uh, enthusiast is looking for? But even in the the high end of our industry, is video tiling really? Is it just a, a niche product, or is this something that you know clients and 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 people are actually looking for and asking for? I, I wouldn't divide it by high and low end. I would rather divide it by use case. I think someone who is, um, you know, I, I go into a lot of homes where customers have a, a sports wall. You know, where they've got four or five TVs on the wall, they want to watch a bunch of different games. Um, I think in that use case, it's fantastic. You know, with the kind of the light commercial space, the, the restaurants and sports bars, um, it can be a great uh, option for people, especially as, as TV screens are getting much larger. Um, but I think just, you know, it, it just depends on what that customer's um, driving purposes for it. You know, someone who just likes to watch movies and Netflix, I don't think that's a big, uh, I don't think time is going to be big, but, but when it comes to the big sports watchers or, you know, the, the, uh, someone who's watching, you know, all the tickers coming in, all the, you know, stock reports, uh, those people matters for, um, but I, you know, I think there is a space for it. Um, but again, it, it just goes back to use cases. Very good. Tim, the biggest thing that I, I pulled out of this that, that kind of really stood out really quickly was not only the fact that they're uh, delivering, quote unquote, lossless 4K60444, which is, as we know, kind of the holy grail of uh, video quality, but specifically that this requires a 10 gigabit network. Now, we just talked about uh, you know, rock solid Wi-Fi, rock solid networks in a home. As Margie said, this is a use case application. I see this and go, okay, from a from a new build, no problem. 10, 10 gig, uh, if I know I'm doing tiling, if I know I'm trying to distribute this level of quality, that's what is going in. We know how often we even find 10 gig in commercial. 
is this going to be a massive sticking point? I, I think that you, you both are right. If, if, if it's a use case, right, it's a case where this is something that somebody wants to put in. The, we're, you know, here in the U.S., we're in the midst of, of football mania and, and, you know, um, two teams are now going to the Super Bowl. Those last few weeks would have been perfect, right? As somebody who's a sports enthusiast, it would have been perfect for them to watch all 1,700 games that went on. Um, you know, somebody who's a baseball fan, uh, which, you know, uh, catchers and pitchers report sometime in, in February. I'm sure Rich could tell us where, uh, at least for the Giants. Um, you know, watching 15. When? When? I was about to say, I know where I'm going to be February 3rd. That's yeah, our, there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> That's apparently the Giants warm up. Um, but, um, you know, lots of stuff like that where you've got folks who want to see multiple things. If a user wants to have, if your homeowner wants to have multiple videos going on at the same time that this does, then, yeah, I don't think putting in a 10 gig switch is much of a sticking point. However, <laughs> It is a premium and they need to understand that, right? Not only do you have to buy the multiple displays to create the wall, not only do you have to buy the video processor for, to, to create the, the multiple videos, but this is an additional expense that having the 10 gig switch um, that they normally haven't spent. Uh, I, I know folks who do video, you know, maybe over IP that is, that is 10 gig. Um, they have quoted a couple prices per port that some folks have, yes, um, sub $100 per port, but there are also several um, switches out there that are several hundred dollars per port. So you, you've got to do your homework and understand that, that this is a premium um, infrastructure that you're putting in to support this, this video wall. Rich, uh, Tim brings up a really good point as far as infrastructure and the costs associated with that. When you go to market something like hey, we can do video tiling in your media room or in your kitchen or anywhere you, you, you so desire it. Obviously, you have to get into you know, the dollars and cents of the entire system, but is this something where you can market it in addition to the, all the network that you're putting in or do you have to put it together as you know, one, one main package? How do you market this type of product? Well, I think the first thing that, that we have to consider is that Savant has announced a proof of concept, right? So in 2009, I've, since 2009, I've had a video tiler in my theater, um, but it was 1080p total. And it took eight HDMI inputs and you know, it, it, it put a scaled output and it is not a cheap piece of equipment that also required a sophisticated control system to make it all work. Fast forward a decade later, now we're talking about a device that is now going to do that over an IP infrastructure. Now, yes, you know, if you think about it, you know, with our 4K and with 8K coming down the line, we're looking at, you know, 18 gigabits of signal. Some of the IP manufacturers have gotten it down to 10 gig. Some of the manufacturers have gotten it down to one gig. So, you know, Savant is taking the approach of saying, in instances where you can have this type of bandwidth in your system, we're ready to provide this for you and you can enjoy your system and the tiling experience um, right now. There's, you know, there, there is an unspoken right there, which is saying that there are going to be other manufacturers and probably Savant themselves who are probably tirelessly looking at ways to integrate this into their legacy systems. But you have to start somewhere. It's, it's much like large displays. Um, you know, a 103-inch plasma 10 years ago was a $150,000 um, device. Now, you know, you're getting 80-inch TVs for 3500 bucks. So, you know, we are going to see as the proof of concept gets rolled out, then you're, they'll, we'll start seeing that scale down and that trickle effect that comes through. Uh, you know, it, that's the beauty of it. When you are dealing with a, a packetized signal, you're not dealing necessarily with a, a copper wavelength that you have to worry over distance. So as time passes, as algorithms get better, we will start seeing other items um, work their way through. I mean, a perfect example is take a look at what Snap AV has been able to do already with video over IP. I mean, it was, uh, you know, video over IP for a period of time was seen as something exorbitantly expensive or out of reach. Now we have, from a distribution standpoint, you know, a device that is providing that at, at a, a cost-sensitive 
um, price. So, you know, I'm excited about it because I, I always think that, you know, when you're, you're blazing the trail, um, that allows you to set yourself apart, maintain, um, you know, the cachet that people are looking for and, and builds the loyalty with your client. Because if you're getting them started early, um, you're only going to get the, the, the downstream trickle. Very good. Let's move on to our next and, and likely last story of the day. Unfortunately, CNET, if you have been sleeping on smart lights, it's time to wake up. Uh, this is a commentary by Rye Chris. If you've followed uh, my show at all or know anything about me, you know that this will be the one that gets me the most excited. Um, hence, I'm a big lighting guy. That's what I'm getting at if you missed it. Uh, essentially, what he's doing is, as you go through this article, he's saying that if you have been avoiding putting off uh, thinking that smart lighting is a joke, it's not. This is time to you know get on board. It has been here long enough, and it is fantastic. Tim, I want to start with you on this. Um, as I'm sure you know, having read this, you probably know where my mind is already going to be. Um, but when I look at this, this is smart lighting, but mostly smart bulbs. Mm -hmm. This is the Home Depot, Best Buy, uh, you know, et cetera, Amazon level of lighting control. Because of what they're saying and because of what this article is covering, does this touch at all on anything remotely that we should be concerned about within this, you know, true Resi AV channel? Concerned? No. Aware of? Absolutely. Uh, the reason for that is, is I see smart lighting and you're right. It's by, by and large, it's smart bulbs, but I see smart lighting and the smart bulbs as a gateway drug, if you will, into larger home automation and, and larger home automation lighting. Um, just like I see people who, who buy uh, Amazon Echoes as an entryway into that. Um, and why I was so excited uh, when both, you know, control four and other uh, control manufacturers came out, that that Cedia um, two years ago now and said you know we're 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 working with with Amazon Echo and, and, and integrating something that is so consumer facing and, and has been adopted uh, obviously by so many other consumers and not just uh, Echo but the Google Home and, and other uh, other uh, voice control speakers they're bringing that into their ecosystem so I see smart lighting as a an entry point uh, and a way for consumers and for residential clients to get used to the idea of controlling your lights get used to the idea of changing the the temperature and the color of your lights uh for various reasons right and you can talk about the reasoning to change the color of your light more than i can uh i know color temperature from a video standpoint right uh, and what we do here at aviation but you and, and Richie and, and other folks who do this, you know, on a daily basis can talk about it from a, a you know, a daylight um, standpoint and a circadian rhythm standpoint and making sure that your body is, is in tune with, you know, um, the earth and making sure that you're getting the right type of, of lights, uh, light, right type of lighting and the right color of lighting. Uh, but I see these as a way to get them interested and get them used to the idea. Uh, Rich, we, we've heard that argument that, that Tim just made for as long as I've been covering the industry. And it's not where I wanted to go with this conversation, but I appreciate it. So I'm going to ask you this. Um, is this really the gateway? Or does this get people in the door to where they say, ooh, I've got these um, Philips Hue, or I've got this Alexa dimmer, maybe, that hopefully works. I've got all these Wi-Fi lights that that work at hopefully when the network goes down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are they actually a gateway? Are, are, are those clients ever going to look at this and say, ooh, now that I've had this, I totally am going to upgrade to a C4 paneled system or a Homeworks Lutron system or anything else? Because, sorry, Tim, I don't buy it. I don't think they're ever going to do it. Ever. Am okay, I wrong? ever is a, wrong, a long time. <laughs> Hey, that wasn't for you. That was for Rich. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you know, you know, maybe they're not the gateway drug. Maybe they're the vape pen to automation. You know, um, you know, it's like yes, this is the strawberry vanilla cream of lighting. Popcorn, oh, chocolate popcorn. Right? The popcorn. Uh, you know, we we have to consider that we have a new generation of consumers who are coming up, who are you know, I I, I constantly 
um, you know, kind of relate to the generational idea of, you know, my generation was the last generation of album buyers. We have an entire generation of consumers who've never had to buy an album in order to get a song. You know, that's a shift, you know, just in how music is played. I think what we're going to be seeing in terms of purchasing patterns is that they are okay with somewhat connected devices that are still kind of autonomously sitting out there on their own. But this kind of dovetails back into the first story, which is the whole Wi-Fi standard, right? And automation going along Wi-Fi. If all of a sudden we're basically dealing with an endpoint, which is an IP address, there's nothing to say that with the larger automation system that's out there that all of a sudden as maybe they do buy a $90 light bulb and they go, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. And they go, oh, maybe I can control it with my Alexa. Next thing they know, maybe they buy a smart TV. Maybe they buy a door camera. Um, you know, their family grows. Next thing they know, um, you know, maybe they want a little bit of music in the house. All of these things have to get bridged together at some point. What is going to be incumbent upon the control system companies? whether they are in the lighting industry, the audio industry, or standalone automation controllers, is they are going to have to find ways to reach inroads with all of these disparate little companies that are out there and saying, and finding ways to communicate and bridging them all together. I mean, that's really been the whole purpose of automation is to operate as an umbrella, right? All these disparate pieces operate underneath the umbrella itself, but there's a unified front end. And some people will see the, the value in that unified front end, and they are able to leverage what they already have, as opposed to, you know, again, I think if you walked in and said, you bought this $90 light bulb, by the way, now you've got to get rid of that, and you've got to buy X company's light switches, and these light bulbs, everything. no, that, that, it's not going to happen. No, Nobody you let, you let them drive it, right? Right, exactly. But, but my point being is that if the conversation becomes, by the way, these items that you've purchased and that are going in your house can be included in a greater unified system that does work with your creature comfort controls and your audio and everything else. That becomes a different conversation as opposed to you're going to spend some good money after bad because you bought wrong the first time. Nobody likes to be told that they bought wrong. Um, and so that is the, the line that has to be walked very carefully in that respect. And I get what you're saying with that, Matt, but, but you know, not everybody is going to buy right because they don't have an experience of what right is at that moment. You know? and, and what you were saying, Tim, is that they're, they're going to have to try it out. So you know, hopefully what we're doing as an industry is starting to look at how can we provide a safety net for that? How can we let them try wrong, but still find ways to bring them back from the abyss and still keep them um, as a client and, and, and growing with them over time in their systems. I mean, that's, that's, that's really the key to everything that, a, a, you know, in our industry as a professional that you're looking to do. Is, are, is are you saying that we, we need to teach them how to fail forward? Fail fast, right? Fail fast. Fail fast, fast into better automation. Mm -hmm. Margie, let, let me give you the last word on this and kind of wrap it up this way. Rich touched on a really good point of the experience <laughs> between, yeah. you know, hue lights and, I, I know for a fact that we've had clients that have went and purchased Hue lights and then they get mad when they don't work because somebody shut off the switch. Yeah. Uh, all those little things. How do we as integrators, as, as manufacturers, as the industry, properly explain the experience difference between all of these DIY products and properly thought out automation systems not necessarily you know ultra high-end automation products but thoughtfully designed systems opposed to just going to best buy and throwing a bunch of stuff in a cart yeah you know when i think of these diy solutions i think of yeah i worked in silicon valley for a lot of years and um and a lot of people in silicon valley they don't own their own homes they um are single or they might have one roommate um, and, and DIY works great for that where, you know, you, you stick a light bulb in and, you know, it's, it's your bedroom and no one else is in it. Um, but the second that, you know, a significant other moves in, uh, the second you have a child, it's like they have a child that uses light switches. Um, all of a sudden everything being controlled from your phone, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't scale. Um, when you've got guests in your home, you know, someone comes for the weekend, uh, they don't know how to turn the lights on. Um, those are key problems that, um, that our industry has answers to. 
where you know you've got a light switch that can act as a light switch um but you also know that if you you know do some double or triple tap you can do something really cool um those are like those are the wow moments um the thing that i find a lot is people really love showing off their homes and and they love being able to say i can easily do this and you can easily do this um and the diy solutions they just they don't they don't scale to that but they are really it, it's like people people get a, a hue light bulb and they go oh, i love the concept but the implementation's tough for me and for the others in my home um and i think that's where our industry has great solutions um and i i, th I think that's a great way to sell people on expanding up beautiful well let's end on that disagreed with me just for the record i did i did agree with him yeah, yeah. want to point that out there that's enough out of you tim okay Thanks so much uh, for a fantastic show. Let's wrap there. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uncle Richie, if people want to connect with you and learn more about what Fergosa Design is all about, where can they go and do that? Uh, well, one of the places is uh, obviously into the, on the interwebs. You can find us at fergosadesign.com. You can type my name in the Googles and all kinds of fun things uh, show up. Twitter, at rfergosa. But most importantly here, uh, we'd love to see you on avianation.tv, not only here on Resi Week, but also with my good friend, Steve Greenblatt, uh, our automation show, uh, A State of Control. Excellent. Thank you so much again. Uh, Margie, hopefully you enjoyed your experience today, even yeah. though you agreed with Tim, which is normally a cardinal sin. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's We're okay. We'll, we'll let it go this time. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, where can people connect with you or more importantly, connect with Control 4? Yeah. Um, Control 4 is uh, online at control4.com. Um, and I am um, happy to connect with anyone. Um, I think email is probably the best. I'm just mduffy at control4.com. So. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Tim, of course, thank you for, uh, for being here today, even though you tried to derail the show as you normally do. Uh, if people want to connect with you, learn more about Aviation, which I will plug in a minute, but you can do it anyways, just for fun. No, I'll let you do it. You can uh, follow me on the Twitters if you'd like uh, at this point. Uh, very soon it's, it's over, so go Blues. Um, and you know, some other stuff on Twitter, I'm sure at TD Tim David Albright on the Twitters. Excellent. Well, thank you again all for joining us for myself. If you'd like to connect with me, you can find me at Matt D. Scott on Twitter and many other social platforms, but more importantly, please stop by aviation.tv where you'll find this show as well as a wide variety of our other shows with all the verticals that we cover. When you visit the website, please take a moment to check out our supporters. We are extremely thankful for their support and ask that you check them out as well. Thanks again for watching. That's all the time we have for this episode of Resi Week.